Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we are delighted to be joined by one of the world's most renowned oceanographers, Dr. Sylvia Earle. She's here to talk to us about her new book, National Geographic Ocean, A Global Odyssey. We're going to get an in-depth look Very funny at the oceans of our home world. We're also going to take a look up in the sky as a trio of planets line up with the moon and the Gemini meteor shower aims to delight sky gazers. And we look in on an odd planet that is really metal. No, 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 seriously, it, it's metal. Now, Early in the evening of Friday the 10th of December, the moon's going to line up in the night sky with the planets Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus. Viewers wishing to see this alignment should head out a bit after sunset and look toward the southwest. The brightest object seen at the bottom of the line is Venus. Up above that and a little to the left lies Saturn, the dimmest of the tetrad. Third in line, continuing our journey up and to the left, lies Jupiter. Finally, that big thing in the upper left, that, that's the moon. So, three days after this alignment, the Geminid meteor shower rains down from the sky. Although most meteor showers peak just before dawn, the Geminids are best seen earlier in the night, say around 10 or 11 p.m. Head outdoors away from city lights and look to the east or to the northeast to see this display. Sky gazers can often see a hundred or more shooting stars per hour from the Geminids, but the moon is shining brightly on Monday the 13th. This means viewers will be limited to 30 or 40 shooting stars per hour even under ideal conditions. 30 is good. Looking at data from NASA's Test Space Telescope, astronomers recently discovered a previously unknown exoplanet composed largely of iron. This world, dubbed GJ367b, is less than three quarters the diameter of Earth and contains a little over half the mass of our own planet. GJ367b orbits its home star once every eight hours, scorching the daylit surface side of that world with temperatures around 1400 degrees Celsius or more than 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. That is hot enough to melt rock. This iron-rich world has no hope of hosting life, but this fascinating discovery shows how astronomers are now able to study worlds smaller than Earth orbiting other stars. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Dr. Sylvia Earle about her new book, National Geographic Ocean, A Global Odyssey. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Dr. Sylvia Earle. She is a marine biologist and oceanographer and she was named Time Magazine's 
first ever Hero for the Planet in 1998. She's here to talk to us about her magnificent new book, National Geographic Ocean, A Global Odyssey. And this is just incredible. Welcome to the show, Sylvia. Thank you for having me on board. Absolutely. So this book to me is just really, really brings back the idea of a coffee table book. The type of thing you put down, put down on your dining room table and just inspire conversation. So what inspired you to write such a tome as opposed to say 12 smaller books delivered monthly at one small monthly charge? Well, I've written a number of books about the ocean, much smaller books that you can tuck into your briefcase or your pocket. But this one was an attempt to actually bring together what we now know about the ocean in a form that is readily accessible to the public at large. Even though it's kind of a big book that you're not likely to carry around with you as easily as some others, it's a, a place to get a collection of real sea stories, if you will. The story of the ocean, we might might have called it Ocean a Cosmic Odyssey, because where else in the cosmos is there a living ocean? We know there's water elsewhere in the universe, but only here have we ha <laughs> Is there an ocean filled with life? Certainly, whales are unique to Earth. can't imagine, even if there are other places out there somewhere with a, an, an ocean with life, would have to look different from what we have here. It's taken four and a half billion years of fine-tuning, of give and take over the ages, with ice ages coming and going, with continents shifting, volcanoes blowing their tops with the atmosphere mod modified and changed from largely carbon dioxide to what we now have with CO2, a very small, just enough carbon dioxide to power photosynthesis, but an atmosphere that's 20% oxygen and about 80% nitrogen, just right for us. Imagine Earth, imagine anywhere else in the cosmos where, where we have a built-in life support system. Earth is our home, and yet we're just, just right now, the most exciting time maybe in all of human history to be a 21st century human being armed with, with knowing what we don't know, but also knowing why it matters to understand and to safeguard the elements on this planet that keeps us alive. And that would be the natural, what, the fabric of life in the ocean and on the land. I have to say, much as I love being a terrestrial <laughs> being, I love forests, I love wild places wherever they are, but the ocean dominates. It's where most of Earth's life exists. The ocean shapes climate and weather, governs planetary chemistry. It is where most of the oxygen is, has been and is being generated. If you look at the climate, you have to consider the carbon cycle. So what is that? It's the passage of, of, of life, of nutrients, of elements from one, one system to another. The carbon cycle and we have disrupted it through putting large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, methane, nitrous oxide, warming the planet. That's one physical characteristic that is, has a very large biological basis, carbon. You are a carbon-based unit, as, as Captain Kirk would say, <laughs> Spock would say, Captain, let's go find carbon-based units <laughs> in the universe and looking for life. And here we've got lot, a lot of it. But we're, we're just beginning to see why it matters to us. Yeah, so that brings to mind, you know, 
why does it matter to you what got you started on a life of studying the oceans? Why doesn't everybody? <laughs> I, I, I understand that. I, I feel I feel that way about astronomy. <laughs> Well, wherever your curiosity leads you, it, you'll find, ultimately, that if you pick up one thing, it's connected to everything Absolutely. and everyone. And no one can do it all. But we can each indulge ourselves with the things that, that strum our heartstrings and, and become more knowledgeable than linking minds and hearts with others. We can do what I tried to do in this book about the ocean to see what do we know? What don't we know? How are we going to find out? And what's it all mean? <laughs> what, what's it mean to our future to either not take care of the ocean, allow it to be clogged with plastic and poisons versus what are the benefits by restoring the ocean to better health by protecting it large areas, not taking new bites out of ocean wildlife, but allowing them to heal the systems that we have ravaged. And how do we do that? How do, how do we undo this damage to the oceans that we've done and that we're continuing to do? COP26 climate conference in Glasgow addressed some of this and endorsed nations around the world as well as individuals and communities to look at the natural systems under their jurisdiction. Countries with a coast have jurisdiction out 200 nautical miles. Beyond that is half the world that is not owned by any one nation that we have to pull together to safeguard the high seas. Half the world. It's the blue heart of the blue heart of the planet where the greatest depths occur. And overall, you know, the average depth of the ocean is about 4,000 meters, about where the Titanic rests, two and a half miles down. Maximum depth, seven miles. And only recently have explorers been able to go, first time in 1960. And more recently, the pace is picking up. So more people now have been to the bottom of the ocean than have been on the moon, but not by a lot. We're, we're just beginning to explore Earth, the aquatic parts of this Earth, even parts of our own terrestrial systems are, are just beginning to be known, like Antarctica. What, what actually is there under the snow and ice? What's under the ocean under the snow and ice? And how does it all fit together? We're beginning to get answers. And I tapped into the, the genius and the hard work of many people who have been trying to find answers and tried to distill it with images and stories in the ocean odyssey. And a lot of, in my opinion, I think you know, a lot of what drives science is our push, our seal to answer unanswered questions to solve mysteries right what for you are some of the greatest unanswered mysteries of the ocean that you're looking to explore well some very basic things who lives in the ocean we've made an inventory the census of marine life involved thousands of scientists around the world during 10 years 2000 to 2010, where all the records that could be accessed in museums, libraries, looking back in time, what was the world like? Who lived in the ocean, as far as we know, in times past? And then to, with expeditions all over the world, to try to get new information. Who's there now? And then to project on into the future, what will be the consequences of what we now have, given the pressures we're now applying to the ocean? Well, we were able to more clearly see the magnitude of our ignorance, that only about a quarter of a million species were known to be named and identified, and a little story about each one, but there might be an order of magnitude more that we don't know. 
especially now that the new means of detecting what a species actually is by looking at their genetic makeup, their DNA, that there are a lot of creatures shaped by water that look a lot alike, but it turns out they're not. They're very different. Like a jellyfish that's known as moon jelly, Aurelia. But it turns out it's not just one species. It's a whole family of species that tend to look alike. Now that we know, we can begin to understand, okay, what about all those places in the ocean where we haven't even been? Like 95% of the, of the ocean. We're terrestrial, so we know quite a lot about insects <laughs> and birds. Even there, though, we're finding new species all the time. So we have a lot of new exploring to undertake right here at home while we also reach for the stars. That's, that, is, that is so fabulous. And, you know, with all the exploring you've done, what has been, what has been some of your most amazing moments, you know, um, when you've just looked at something and gone, my God, it's full of, you know, it's, it's, it's miraculous. What, what, is, what has inspired that feeling in you? I think there were a couple of things that stand out, and that is that every creature on Earth is an individual. We know that with humans. We're not even twins. They're different. <laughs> that we all have unique chemistry, and we all have unique associations with our inner biome, the bio, the microbiome, little bacteria and archaea that set up housekeeping as a part of who we are individually. And that's true with birds. It's true with cats and dogs, horses, cows. <laughs> and the, the, the microbial network of life is just beginning to come into the public consciousness as critically important, not as enemies to protect ourselves from bacteria and viruses, but to realize we can't live without them that the great majority are vital components of our existence. So I think that revelation about getting to know fish as individuals, living underwater 10 times, you spend enough time, you go back to the same place, the same fish is there, not just yesterday and tomorrow, but <laughs> next year, 10 years. Some scientists have been studying the same fish that lives in that same burrow over more than a decade, yeah. you really get to know them. <laughs> yeah. Like the birds in your backyard, you get to know the fish in the ocean's backyard. And I think that is, that's been a breakthrough for me. As a kid, I only knew fish on a plate or in the market. But now to see fish as fellow citizens, if you will, occupying aquatic space with families, with communities, with language, with senses that I can just barely imagine that what it, what it must be like to live in the ocean, to live in the dark all of the time, except for the capacity to generate light and signal others with light in, in the, while in the dark. <laughs> it, just, it blows your mind to think about the, the real nature of life on earth. It's not, you know, <laughs> like us, <laughs> it's all that other Many variations on the theme of of how the basic elements of life can be arranged in such extraordinary diverse forms. That's one thing, to realize that most of life on Earth lives not just in the dark some of the time, but all of the time. Go below where light penetrates in the sea. It's dark. It's beautiful dark because these little lights flashing all around, but it looks like the skies above. It looks like the Milky Way when you get down into the deep sea and you see all this, these conversations going on, little flashing lights, creatures bumping into one another and they either say, oh, excuse me, and flash with light, or mm, you look delicious and gobble up that creature that flashed, or they're signaling to other creatures through the, through the aquatic world they live in and you blink, blink, and you get a blink, blink back. 
and that enables them to get closer and find each other and hoop it up and make more whatever it is they are. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just amazing. And to realize here we are, creatures who like temperature within a certain pretty narrow range when you consider in the universe how wide the temperature range is. And we, we need this special, very limited range is comfortable for us. And where it isn't, we fix it with air conditioning or we fix it with heating mechanisms, fire and burning fossil fuels to warm our otherwise uninhabitable places. But most creatures can't do that. Most creatures like it cold. They live in the dark. And if we took them into our living room, they'd die. If we take ourselves in their living room, we die. Unless we package ourselves in little submarines <laughs> and go down to visit. But we really need to do that so we can see the world through their eyes. After all, they dominate. We think we're the big boss of the planet, and we certainly have magnified influence, and we've altered the nature of nature, mostly mostly in ignorance, not knowing what we're doing. We just cut the trees, and we just catch the fish, we just dump things in the ocean, thinking it won't matter. It now does. we know. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Sylvia. It was great talking with you. Great to be part of the action. Fabulous. <laughs> thank you. And that was Dr. Sylvia Earl, marine biologist, oceanographer, and author of National Geographic Ocean, a Global Odyssey. The best 2.7 kilograms of book you'll see this year. <laughs> Next week, on the 14th of December, we're going to welcome Mark McCorcoran, Senior Advisor for Space and for Science and Exploration at the European Space Agency, to the show. We're going to talk about uh, the Beppe Colombo mission to Mercury. And on the 21st of December, we're going to take an up-close look at the James Webb Space Telescope. As that mission Jazz readies hands. for its career exploring the depths like of you. the cosmos. Subscribe or follow today and never miss an episode. Remember, you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. Now, we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. For more information on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Hmm.